Welcome back. You're watching Stockwatch with me, Zanati Guma, and joining me to unpack your stock-related questions tonight are Jean-Pierre Ferstad from Protea Capital Management and Mark Dudoy from Oyster Catcher Investments. Be sure to send your questions via email to stockwatch at bdtv.co.za or via SMS on 41392 or on X at Business Day TV using the hashtag Stockwatch. Thank you so much for your time, gents. Um, it seems the markets are shook by this U.S. inflation print that we got. Um, but, Mark, starting with you, I thought that the markets were kind of settling into the fact that we'll have a higher for longer situation for a while. Yes, I mean, I think we started the, started the year with um, expectations of the rate cutting to begin in March. And subsequently, the market um, sold off a bit, got used to the idea that the rate cuts would come a bit later in the year. And then today we saw that the U.S. inflation number came in higher than expected, which means um, the, you know that the, the, the Fed might actually have to keep rates higher for slightly longer. Uh, and immediately the the U.S. bonds kind of repriced to 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 the expectation that the rate cut will move out an, an extra month. But I mean, I think that um, I think the real underlying story is that rates should be coming down this year and i mean for the market to be constantly spooked as to if it's going to be march or june or july i mean i don't think it's something that you should worry too much about unless you're a short-term kind of trader so longer term we expect rates to come down and we expect um you know markets to be fairly supported yeah i mean also for me what jumped out uh, jp is the fact that that acceleration in uh in january was actually less than the 3.4 percent that we saw in december so i mean it's good inflation is moving in the right direction but now markets are spooked because they're just higher than what the analysts had anticipated what, what do you make of this no exactly uh, it, it does feel like we're almost getting into that goldilocks zones in rt mm -hmm. where it's not too high it's not too low it's not too whole not yeah. too hot it's not too cold and if we can stay in that range of expectations that um inflation is higher obviously than what it has been say over the last even 10 years but it's not going to spike any further then having 10-year interest rates at these types of levels including say a quarter or a half or even three quarters of a percent lower six to nine months from now is a pretty good place to be. Um, a lot of people forget that for, well, it's basically since the 2008 financial crisis, so call it for 16 years, rates have been abnormally low. Mm. And we are only now back to a normal range, maybe slightly higher than what is normal, but still a normal range. And I do believe that that is generally good for most companies, uh, except for the very, very high indebted ones, if rates are close to normal. So it is part of, I would say, a healthy cycle to get back to normal. So I agree mm. with you, maybe a little bit of negativity in the markets today. Mm. But longer term, uh, I'm not too worried about today's CPI print. Yeah. We're well, talking about negativity. There's a question here. Please explain um, the huge dip in resource shares today. Uh, there is a specific time at 12. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you guys were looking at your screens at 12 spe specifically. But of course, I did see uh, that... A lot of the, the resource counters, Harmony, DRD Gold, Sibanye, all of them are in the red. Uh, Mark, what is the reason for this? Yeah, so again, it's, it's the US inflation print. And um, with interest rates now, the expectation of being interest rates being higher for a little bit longer, US dollar will be uh, relatively a little bit stronger, which is negative for, for commodity prices. Um, so, I mean, I, it's just the... Maybe the anticipation of the inflation rate coming in lower and then it disappointing and people, you know, traders kind of selling their, their positioning. So short term volatility is what I would kind of put it down to. Yeah. And actually, as I'm talking about those stocks, um, the gold ones have been the ones that have been hit pretty hard. Um, JP, is this all the interest rate story, but also is the uncertainty in terms of geopolitics and that not supportive enough for gold at this point? Apparently not. Inflation, at least for today, yeah. <laughs> weighs more than <laughs> geopolitical uh, nervousness. So uh, inflation higher than expected, the gold price came off. The gold price comes off, the gold miners come off. Yeah. Notwithstanding the fact that the rand was also weaker. So you do have uh, forces and counter forces. Um, a weaker rand is generally good for the mining companies, but the gold price fell even more, meaning that 
the rand price of gold was lower not just the dollar price and yeah. then gold fields also come out with a trading statement today yeah. and it's probably more or less what was expected the earnings are going to be a little bit lower they try to explain it if they take off out some once offs you know they still happened but they said it's once offs we should ignore them then the profits are roughly flat from a year ago but still lower if you if you take the normal risk of pulling gold out of the mine into the income statement um, and that did not support the gold miners either. Yeah, and yeah, I must tell you, I was taken aback by uh, the headline earnings per share figure that they do expect 25% um, lower. Um, and of course, for me, I was just like, how when the gold price have, has been so supportive? But of course, you talk about those once off fees like the, the Yamana deal, a uh, break fee. Um, at this point, uh, Mark, would you be looking into those gold counters or is there just a little bit of uncertainty now because of what we have seen with the gold price, at least in the short term? Yeah, I think that, um, I think that what is, has been supporting the gold price is there's um, added demand from central banks, particularly from China and those in, in the East wanting to hold a larger percentage of reserves in gold. So we have seen more central uh, bank reserve gold buying, which is supportive of the gold price. And then added to that, the kind of geopolitical tension. I mean, we've got kind of two um, headline wars on the go at the moment, um, which again is means a, a higher gold price. But, um, you know, going forward, maybe a little bit of support from low interest rates. We don't see the gold price shooting the lights out from here. So um, we do own some some gold shares, but we don't have a large overweight position in them. Ah, all right. Uh, let's go into more commodities. There's a question here on rhodium. I'd be very interested to know your views on whether you see value in rhodium at present. Um, okay, yeah, let's start off with that. Uh, JP. So if you look back to, I would call it the PGM bubble, because the PGM basket price went through the roof and then in the last year to 18 months has effectively collapsed. The big driver thereof has been rhodium, not platinum or palladium. And in weight terms, rhodium is relatively small in terms of production, but it became so expensive per mm -hmm. ounce that it drove the PGM basket price up and then it collapsed. So it drove the PGM basket price down. Um, now, as I understand it, some rhodium is used in um, some uh, uh, manufacturing, not okay. just for jewelry and not just for industrial use. Uh, uh, fiberglass, for instance, is a user of rhodium. Um, and it just seems like there was a, a demand supply imbalance, which drove the price up. And now that that imbalance has gotten closer to a balance, the price is down. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it, with the benefit of hindsight, I would say that maybe rhodium got too expensive, drove the PDM basket price. And now we're back to a normal level with more focus on the platinum and palladium portions of the PGM basket. Um, and that will potentially drive the PGM price, uh, basket price forward rather than uh, rhodium, seeing that it came off what, with the benefit of hindsight, was a bubble. Mm. And rhodium was, was the biggest driver of the downturn. It's the one that lost the most value, right, JP? Correct. Yeah. All right. Well, with that... Um, now the price has uh, has normalized a little bit. Uh, Mark, would you say that it is a buy, um, also considering uh, the medium and uh, long-term investment horizon? Yeah, I mean, it, it is a very interesting situation. The, the price of rhodium was about $3,000 an ounce for, uh, for a long time. Now it's about $4,000 an ounce. Um, I mean, we do is, is, so expect supply to, to tighten in the PGM space from here because uh, the South African PGM miners um, are not making the, you know, the, the amount of money that they used to at these prices. So they should look to, to take a bit of supply out of the, out of the system. And then the North American, um, mostly palladium miners, um, are loss making. So that supply at some point should come out. Um, of, of the system and the market will tighten, which will be good for, for PGM prices. Um, it's difficult to say from a basket point of view, if it's gonna be enough to to support um, the, the price level of the miners at this stage, um, it's probably too too soon to be buying PGM miners. Um, but I think in the long term, you've probably got a good, um, a good skew to the upside in Rodham specifically for the, for the question. Yeah. Uh, JP, would you be buying into PGMs right now, considering uh, the pressure that we've seen in those shares and also the miners? 
Well, Mark referred to something quite important. That is that the rhodium price now is roughly $4,000 pounds and it was 3,000 if you go back before the bubble. Yeah. So in general terms, one must calibrate yourself to reality, long-term reality. If you calibrate yourself to short-term reality, you would say, my gosh, look how far rhodium has dropped and the old PGM basket has dropped. Surely we are near the bottom and it will turn, turn up. But if you calibrate yourself to the long term, we're only back to call it roughly normal levels because we had, like I said, with the benefit of hindsight, mm -hmm. a rhodium bubble. Yeah. And you normally don't have two bubbles directly after each other. So if this is one of these cases where the hangover is proportional to the party, we could have quite a long hangover because we had quite a big rhodium party. So I also think it's too soon to buy the PGM miners and some of them with stretched balance sheets might get into a little bit of trouble first. And once there's blood in the streets and you have pressure on balance sheets, which isn't the case yet, mm. I think then one can take a closer look at the platinum miners. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the, uh, the hangover example and analogy. Um, I think you made it much simpler for us to understand. <laughs> um, let's get to Rena Jen. Um, with Renogen now back to the lows of a few months ago, uh, is this now a serious concern for the stock? Or is it just a reflection of the incredibly low gas prices? Um, so, of course, I even read an article on Business Live today um, that said that uh, the rhodium share price has been down over a third uh, this year. Um, Mark, yeah, the pressure that's on uh, Renogen right now, is there actual real concern for the prospects of the company or is it a reflection of the prices, of the gas prices? Yeah, so, I mean, I think there, there is a bit to be said for the, the LNG price, that, which has come down um, in recent months. So Renogen at this point is selling uh, LNG gas. Uh, the real story there with Renogen is the helium, which is, uh, which comes out together with the energy gas. So they want to um, expand their plant. They want to do phase two, which will be a much bigger plant. They want to export helium to the US. And that's really the business case for energy. And, um, and that's going to require quite a lot of um, capex, um, about a 20 billion rand build for phase two. So then the process of trying to raise capital in the US, um, the idea at, at a point was to list energy in the US in order to do that. Uh, and, and that's what they're busy doing. So at this point, Renogen, as an investment case, seriously requires additional capital to, to be able to increase the size of that plant. And that's what everyone's waiting for. And when that gets announced, then we'll be able to see, you know, maybe that is potentially a good buying opportunity. But I would wait to hear what the story is regarding the funding. Actually, a lot of investors aren't waiting, considering where the share price has gone. Even uh, Ivanhoe Mines has been offloading its uh, stake on Renogen. Um, JP, is the, is, the, is the wait, is it worth the wait? Well, Zanati, I'll, I'll say what I've said before. It's very speculative because the company is in very, very early stages. And as South African investors, we're not used to having a lot of opportunities listed in, on, on our market, which is basically venture capital. Yeah. It's very early in the life cycle of a company. It's when the company is still loss making, potentially where they are still looking to, to raise capital. They have plans, they have dreams, they have hopes, but they don't have capital. And that is the phase in which Renogen is currently. So I prefer to wait for some of those hopes and dreams to turn into reality and for the company to have capital. That means I sometimes miss out on big upside in mm -hmm. the early years because you can get uh, spectacular share moves when a company goes from very low expectations, loss making, to some of those hopes and dreams coming closer to fruition. But I'm okay to miss out on them because you also don't kiss a lot of frogs. They don't turn into princes. There's a lot of companies that don't raise the capital they need, and I avoid them as well. So I'll, I'll wait on the sidelines. Yeah, all right. Uh, well, uh, what would you do on EOH? Um, there is a question here. St uh, CEO uh, resigned, uh, Stephen Van Collar, a CEO resigned from EOH and his last day is March 2024. Uh, will there be more downfall in share price? So the viewer says my average price is 3 Rand 37 with the current levels of 1 Rand 10. If I hold another four more years, can I pass my 3 uh, three Rand 37 cents average price? Of course, the question is, can it go up or is there more downfall in the share price expected? Um, Mark? 
Yeah, I think that, um, I think if I rewind back sort of two years when Stefan van Kuller came in, or three years now, um, you know, I had a quite a fairly positive view that he'd be able to turn the, the company around. I think they've done some fantastic work. They've paid down debt. They've sold businesses that kind of were non core. But I think that the macro environment has been extremely tough for a, a company that's selling IT services. Um, and, you know, government hasn't been spending on big projects and business in South Africa hasn't been spending on big projects. So I think that the macro has been very tough for them. Um, I'm not sure. I think the, the prospect of getting 3.70 in, in, the, in the next four years is probably fairly slim because, I mean, that would be like a 300 or 400% increase from here. Um, but yeah, and I, I do think if South African GDP can get going, interest rates can come down, put more confidence post our elections. I mean, that's a nice back, backdrop for year age. But um, it is tough out there for them at the moment. Yeah, so even at one rand ten right now, it's at one rand five today. It went down five percent. Um, JP, what are your thoughts on the uh, on the prospects of the EOH share price? So I'm looking forward to a clean set of results. There have been so many once-offs and settlements and liabilities and provisions. Sure. So um, with with the last capital raise they made. They're finally at a point where there is now a sustainable corporate structure. That is why Stephen Felt, as I, as I understand it, that he's, his job is done effectively. Yeah. It's time for a new CEO that will now focus with the balance sheet fixed on growth from here. So um, there is potential upside. Um, but yeah, to get into the threes from one round, that's a tripling. <laughs> that's quite an ask. Yeah. So I, um, I think there's potential here. But it is quite risky because um, except for the whole... AI and automation part of IT, the more traditional part of IT where specifically you do hardware supply and then solutions which are traditional, that's quite a saturated market. You need to be in that in that sexy area of AI. Um, then you can uh, get some new clients and grow your revenue strongly. So we need to wait for a clean set of results and see if they can come up with so solutions in, in that area of IT services. Mm. Well, investors waiting for a sexy area of transaction capital where they uh, separately list we buy cars. Of course, they came out with updates today, uh, a voluntary trading update on we buy cars, but also um, the board saying that they are actually going for this um, this, this separate listing. Uh, Mark, that share price was up. 8%, but obviously not enough to unbreak uh, a lot of our hearts. Um, what did you make of the announcements today? <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's positive. I mean, uh, Coronation's a big shareholder there at TCP, and I'm sure that they're driving this this process, and they're going to end up being a large shareholder in uh, We Buy Cars. Um, I mean, we're busy crunching the numbers now, but guys next door busy on the on the deal. Um, I think a lot's going to come down to what your valuation of We Buy Cars is, is and whether you, you're happy to pay 10 times earnings or you want to pay 15 times earnings for the business. I think that's going to um, you know, make a, a big difference into whether you want to get involved. And then you also have to decide, do you want to buy TCP shares now and then you land up with some We Buy Cars and then the rest of TCP? Or potentially you can wait for the actual listing. Um, which I think might be a little bit more dangerous because these things tend to, to run on listings and you you, you, let, you normally buy your shares on listing and then wait three years for the, for the share price to kind of first go down and then, and then start going up again. So, so we are busy crunching the numbers as we speak. <laughs> JP, what do transaction uh, capital investors do right now? Do they just sit still? This one is sitting still, the Nati. So... Um... We have been transaction capital shellers for a while now. I think my average in price is around 12 rand. So I was a bit too early. Should have waited a little bit. I was I earlier that than falling you. Knife. <laughs> yes, yes. So I've, I've got some, I've got some marks in my hand from from the <laughs> knife. But um, look, they, they say in the announcement that the independent expert values the group at 11 rand something. So not too mm. far off where uh, where I also thought fair value was. Um, so I believe sit tight. Uh, you will get your we buy shares unbundled out of transaction capital. Unfortunately, not 75%. There'll be dilution. There's the placement 500 million to coronation. Then there's going to be another probably 700 million rent placement on listings. So not just an unbundling. Transaction capital is also going to sell some shares. So at the end of the day, they'll end up with closer to high 50% stake in uh, we buy cars that they'll unbundle. 
So the upside is a little bit less than what I expected. But if I take the valuation of we buy cars, even with that dilution out of transaction capital, plus the valuation of Newton, plus the fact that the just over 1 billion rand will probably raise to fix the holding company there. So they isolate SA Taxi from, from Newton and allow Newton to get more financing, to buy more books and actually grow their profitability. I get to a sound the part still closer to the 12 rand where, where I entered. So mm. I would st uh, sit tight. I think there's an opportunity. It's a special situation in my opinion. I have a question for you on that, but I just want to quickly go to Mark on transaction, or we buy cars rather. Um, do the numbers that we saw today out of that trading update support um, this uh, value that the company is uh, attaching to we buy cars for this journey of listing that they're going on? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I guess your, your question, you, you've got to try and have in your mind what you think the growth, growth prospect is for, for we buy cars. I think that there is opportunity for them to take further market share in the South African context. So, I mean, we think that there is further growth in We Buy Cars. The current earnings that they um, announced are coming off a low base. So, you know, they can't take the 20% growth rate and just extrapolate that. Um, you know, but it is quite difficult to, to, to decide how much you want to pay for those earnings because there's not a, an easy business to compare it to. There are US businesses, but they are slightly different to We Buy Cars. So, yeah, I think like, you know, there's going to be something between 10 and 15 times earnings that you'd be willing to pay for your bulk cars, depending on what your, your growth prospects are. Yeah, all right. Well, before we get to your stock picks, uh, JP, talking about special uh, situations, there is a question here. What special situations are you looking at or invested in the JSC? So let me just explain the special situation, or mm. some people call them workouts, is basically where there's some events. You're not just buying a share because you think the company has got good long-term prospects. Yeah. So transaction capital is a special situation because of the coming unbundling of transaction of uh, we buy cars. Mm. Another one on my list would be multi-choice. It's a special situation because we've got this indication of an offer. It's not an offer yet at 105 Rand and the share price has now crept up to just under that. So something's got to give, something's going to happen next. Let's wait and see. I've got my popcorn out. <laughs> I've got some ideas. I am bullish. Yeah. Um, so let's see what's going to happen. So. Those are two special situations, transaction capital and multi-choice. Uh, all right. Well, Jens, let's get to your stock picks for today. Mark, what are you uh, hanging your hat on today? Yes, I'm picking APSA. So I think that the, the next set of results, we're going to see uh, the credit loss ratio start to improve, so less losses. But I think that the, the June was the peak of the cycle, the credit loss cycle. Um, and then we're expecting interest rates to come down. Inflation's a bit lower. Uh, wage growth hasn't been too bad, so there's a bit more... Um, added impetus to the economy, which means I think sort of 12 months out, the loan growth will be slightly better for the banks. And Abs has been really quite hammered quite hard after Jason Quinn left. Um, they didn't signal well to the market what was happening in their loan book in, in December, but they, they tried to rectify that with a, with a call with the analysts and a, and a, and a um, trading update. So I think that uh, this set of results may be not that exciting, but I think the prospects for the, for the group are quite good. And uh, you really are not paying much for it. I mean, you're paying less than book value, 0.9 times book value. It's paying over 8% dividend yield. And you get a bit of earnings growth and, uh, and a re-rating in the stock as well. So I think that um, I think it's a good time to buy it. So. All right. JP, what are you banking on? A bank. I'm also choosing oh, a bank. Oh, okay. A European <laughs> bank, an Italian bank called uh. Unicredit. It's one of the biggest Italian banks. And very similar to what Mark just uh, explained. It's also a bank that... Um, they uh, fixed their loan book. They're trading at 0.9 times book, but their ROEs are now substantially higher than the cost of equity. So that would imply you can justify a price to book ratio well in excess of the book value, not a discount. It's trading at a 6 PE and the dividend yield above 6%. And I think uh, why European banking investors have got this misconception about the fair value of a lot of European banks is because rates have been so low. Like I said, since 2008, rates have been abnormally low. And you had some banking issues a year ago in the US. But the US banking system is very similar to Europe. In the US, a consumer can fix their home loan for 10 years. So the bank must take the risk. In Europe, like in South Africa, if uh, the, the reference rate moves, you as the consumer needs to pay more. So the banks don't take that risk, the interest rate risk on long-term loans. So that is why I like the European banking sector and I like Unicredit, 
cheap and good quality. All right. Thanks so much for your analysis today, gents. Really appreciate it. That is all for Stockwatch tonight. Thanks to our guest, Jean-Pierre Ferster from Protea Capital Management and Mark Dudoy from Oyster Catcher Investments. Up next, the close. Stay watching. <laughs>